Right, well, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Mike Rufo. He is running for Congress as a libertarian, excited to lend him this platform, bring him on as a guest and promote his campaign. So Mike, give us the background, tell us about yourself and why you decided to run. Well, I, I decided to run because I had enough, right? As many of us have had, you know, there was a uh, there was a moment in 2016 when Trump was clearly starting to become the front runner in the Republican Party and having been a, an old Ron Paul supporter and wanting to really hope and pray that the Ron Paul movement could stay alive in the Republican Party. I stuck around and, uh, you know, I wasn't active. I wasn't an activist. I wasn't doing things on the street, but I had, had enough and I threw my hands in the air and I said, I'm done. I found the Libertarian Party, got involved helped out with the Pete Warman campaign in, in, in for governor in 2017. And in 2018, I said, I'm going to throw my hat in a ring. I ran for Congress in this district in 2018. Um, connected with a ton of people, really got the message out there. Uh, helped Murray Sabrin with his Senate campaign that year. And then, you know, this year it came up. They asked me if I was going to do it again. I was asked to run for Senate. I said, I can't afford to do a statewide run. It would be it would be a bad decision on my part to do so. There was no Wait, way. Hold on, hold on a second, Mike. You can't figure out a way to go broke running for Congress. Really? You can only go broke running for Senate as a libertarian? It's, it's, a, it's a lot easier to go broke running for Senate than it is for Congress. It's a smaller area. It's a much smaller area. You know? I don't, hey, Mike, when I ran for Congress, it was New Mexico's third district, the whole <laughs> northern third of the state, yeah. bigger than the entire state of Pennsylvania. What's your district? How big is it? My district is maybe 30 miles wide by 20 miles north and south. It's, it's, it's a local district. It's really, it's not huge. It's Jersey. So maybe it's like one, one town in, in, in New Mexico. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so like it, it's from Trenton to Belmar and then from um, the Marlboro area down to about Lakehurst where the air base is. Uh, well, yeah. The joint base now. Um, so it, it is worth pointing out because I, I encourage everybody to run for office as a libertarian. If you see an opportunity, even if it's a paper campaign where all you do is buy your paperwork and then you get to maybe be in a debate, maybe do some interviews, put up a website, you know, at very least you're going to get some, you know, local media coverage. Do it. Jump up on the free platform and enjoy it. With, and, and it's like, how many? It, it, it drives me nuts. And Mike, please let me know what you think about this as, as, as a way of encouraging more people to to to, uh, to to run. Because how many libertarians do we have on social media, like furiously posting away every day? Go, ah, we need to get people to read my stuff. We need people to understand my ideas. We need people to listen to me. We just need everybody to hear me, and then the world would be better, and America would be fixed if we could just listen to the libertarians. And there's this place where there's like. There's an empty chair on the stage with a big L on it, and it doesn't stand for loser. It stands for libertarian. You just go sit up there, and hey, now you're talking to a bunch of people that you never talked to before. And it's like yeah, it, the it, the overhead is not that much. So, Mike, given given that perspective, you know, what are your thoughts for someone you know considering running as a if, libertarian for the first if time? Even, if you're even considering it, just do it. You know, Nike, that Nike campaign of just do it is the most amazing campaign of all time because when something needs to get done, the answer is simple. You so, know, no, no, it's not. No, it's not. Screw Nike. Screw <laughs> that corporate. Uh, no, no, screw that corporate. That is a corrupt corporation. They stole the phrase and so brilliantly attached their brand to just do it. That's like if they if they change their slogan to yes, and every time we said yes, we had to be it's yes, Nike. They're like, no, no, you can't brand <laughs> that. How do they brand just do it? That's that's like such a you say an important phrase. Can we say just do it without saying Nike for the rest of human history? Probably not. No, no, good for them. <laughs> but no, seriously, just do it. I, I mean, it, it, there's nothing to it. I mean, if if nine times out of ten, that person is a keyboard warrior already as it is. And they know what they're saying and they know what they're talking about. It's uncomfortable. Life is uncomfortable. You get out there, put your name out there, talk about the topics because people want to hear it. And that's the one thing I find running for, for office is that you get in front of a group of people, they genuinely have questions. They genuinely want to know, what do you stand for? What are we doing? How does this work? What, oh, if that happens, what's going to go this way? And you just have the conversation with them. And then what'll there's going to come this moment when you're running for office 
when somebody's going to walk up to you when you get off the stage or when you're done addressing the crowd and they're going to pull you to the side and they're going to be like, that was awesome. I'm really glad you said what you said. How do I find out more about you? And how do I find out more about the Libertarian yes. Party? And that, yes. that right there is worth its weight in gold. The moment that happens, you've won your campaign. Yep. Yeah, you really have because you've reached somebody and then they're going to go tell 10 people themselves. And, and mm -hmm. then that's how it works. So if you're thinking about doing it, just do it because it's really all that needs to happen. Awesome. So, Mike, who are you running against? What are the issues in your district? All right. So I'm running against a 38-year incumbent in Chris Smith. Um, he's Mr. Quiet. He, he flies under the radar. He avoids all the controversial topics. He, is the, he was the lone Republican before Van Drew switched, back, switched to the Republicans after using the Democrats to get elected um, in 2018. He, uh, he's so, so let me so let me this is this is like a gerrymandered Republican district within the state of New Jersey yes. where they, they 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 kind of they want to isolate all of their Republicans yes. so that the rest of the seats in the state can go Democrat right yeah and in the South typically the South half of New Jersey they typically do go Republican um, they had a very uh, the Republicans had a very um, polarizing person run in the district that they that the Democrats won. So it, that's, that may swing back Republican, but this district is very gerrymandered because it borders up against Trenton and Camden and Burlington and a lot of some there. And it, it, it seems to carefully cut out that blue corridor that comes down to New Jersey Turnpike on the Western side of the state. Yeah. Um, and, but he's, you know, he, he's been there forever. He's not, he was, he ran in 78 as a Democrat lost, came back and 80 as a Republican. And he's been there ever since this will be 40 years if he wins again this year. And uh, he's just soft. He's ranked the number five bipartisan congressman, which just means he's the fifth best at screwing everybody. You know what I mean? He's just, he knows how to spend the most money, when to spend it. And he, he doesn't talk out on, on controversial things. He's talk, he, he's worried about the, the Hong Kong protesters right now. And I understand and was worried about them too. But right now we've got protesters getting gassed and beaten and, and knocked out. And he hasn't said a word about it. So... I don't understand. You know, you got you got Justin Amash with his qual and, and qualified immunity, and Chris Smith is silent. He's weak on guns. He 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 supports the bump stock bans. He supports the magazine restrictions. He's not an advocate for the Second Amendment whatsoever. And he votes for every pot, every big spending bill that comes across his his little vote card. Yeah. So I, I want to point out just what, how this makes it an extra fun race for a libertarian to run. And, you know, again, for my audience, encouraging everybody to look for these kinds of opportunities <clears throat> based on where you live. You know, maybe there's a, a mayor's race or a city council or a county supervisor race that <clears throat> excuse me, gives you a great warm up. I think running for Congress you know, like we should have a really we should have a libertarian running for Congress in every single district in America. There's not a single one that it's not at least worth one activist putting in the effort to run a you know, serious paper campaign, right? As in, you put up a website, you file, and you know you check your email, and, and you pursue interviews and, and speaking forum opportunities and, and get out and, and kind of do that. Um, but in your race in particular, when you have a 38-year incumbent, every two years, they have to trot them out in public and, you know, and, and go, you still want to vote for this guy? And I would bet that the Democrats run someone every year but it's not a serious campaign. It's probably less serious than a lot of libertarian campaigns, right? It's kind of their sacrificial lamb just to have a Democrat on the ballot. In 2018, they went hard at him because of the whole blue wolf, the whole blue wave thing. And they um, didn't think that the gentleman that they had put up, Josh Welly, was uh, capable of doing the job. Um, it's just, Chris Smith, is, it, it, it's, he's got his perfect little nook. He gets 60 to 58 to 60% of the vote every two years. In his so what, was, what was the number in 18? What, was, what did he win with last year or last time? I want to say he had 55% and Willie had, had, well, had 44. That's actually closer than, than I would have expected from the impression you gave. But, but that, was their, that, was the big, that was with a huge Democrat effort to unseat an incumbent. So normally in a race like that, and if it was more lopsided, and by the way, if you have an incumbent consistently getting reelected with 55% of the vote, you go, that's a safe seat. Yeah. That's all they have to do to make it safe because it's, it's, it's such a, a taut system in so many ways. They don't have to, like, what, what are the odds that 
suddenly you're going to get 5% lower voting for Republicans in a district from one cycle. It's pretty low. Those, I mean, these things are very consistent from cycle to cycle. But if you had a case where, like, you know, the incumbent was blowing it out with, like, you know, 60 plus percent or even 70 percent as in some places, you know, they don't the, the, the opposition party doesn't even bother to run a serious race. And when they go, you still want to vote for this guy? You know, you can be the one going, I don't I don't. And you can make a lot of noise and have a lot of fun, even like if you have no serious chance of winning. But if you're running against someone who is like there are a lot of unopposed races. Yes. There, I, you know, and, and what I was getting at is that it's de facto unopposed when the opposition party isn't running a commensurately serious, uh, proportionately serious campaign against the incumbent. And there's a media vacuum there that's even more opportune, more ripe for taking advantage of. So um, how's it going with, with media? So to give me a timeline of your campaign for 2020 announcement, fundraising, website, things like that. And, and how's it going with media outreach and, and events for you? So the media in Jersey pretty much blocks us out. It's, I, what does your shirt say, by the way? It's, it just says media, that's all I can read. Effective devil in America. Yep. <laughs> I got it from Maj. Um, nice. But uh, the media in, in Jersey, they, we, we send out press releases constantly. I'm, I'm, I'll write a thing here and there, and it, it doesn't get put out. It, it, nobody picks it up. It's very rare they run it. Um, I'm figuring once the primaries finish up, I'll get my couple of paragraphs here and there as I did in 2018. Uh, the primaries in New Jersey are, have been pushed to J July 7th. They were supposed to be t tomorrow, um, but everything got pushed to July 7th. So uh, we're working on signatures. I'm almost done with my collecting my signatures. We announced I, everybody in the party in New Jersey knew I was running for 2020 last year. Um, the formal announcement came in March. Yeah, yeah, about that. Yeah, about that. Let me just say one thing for people who are considering running as libertarians, talk to your state chair that this is a big part of their job is organizing major races. And if you go, hey, I'm, I, I want to run a paper campaign. I want to talk about libertarian ideas. W w ask them, you know, what should I run for? Talk to your county chair, but your state chair first, because I think the biggest gap among libertarian candidates is U.S. Congress for House that we don't have someone running for every seat. In, in the, and you don't even have to live in your district, by the way, as long as you live in the state in most states, because the, because the districts have been so manipulated. If you live just outside and you want to represent this community, anyway, they let you run uh, in, in any district in your state. And if you can coordinate that, it's really easy. They'll tell you, hey, we don't have anybody running for Senate this year. Why don't you run for Senate? Hey, we don't have anybody running for you know CD3 this year, run in, run in that district. Or, you know, we don't, there's a big mayor's like, hey, we have an opportunity with a mayor running unopposed for re-election. There's the opportunity. Coordinate with your state or county party, state party first. But yeah, get involved that way. Sorry, back to you, Mike. No, that's that's fine. I mean, that, and that's that's really how it works. I, I've, I've fielded probably, in the last two months, I've probably fielded four or five people emails asking, hey, how do I run? What do I do? I point yes. to the questionnaire and then we do it. Yeah, the last part of that thought, I'm sorry, Mike, is is let's avoid libertarian primaries on you know anything other than president and vice president, yes. right? If, if, and and I've I've been to I I would bet I've been to more libertarian party state conventions than almost anybody alive today. Maybe maybe there are like a dozen people who are like party actors who've been around for decades who have me beat, but you know not not very many and. Most of them don't have primaries. And just so you know, the primaries are very polite affairs. You know, you show up at, at, at your weekend state convention. Hey, there are two of you who want to run for Senate. All right. You got 15 minutes each. Convince us that you can run the better cam campaign. People there vote. All right. You're going to be our nominee for, for, for governor or for Senate. Like occasionally you see contested libertarian primaries for governor, sometimes for Senate when there's like a big hot race and, it's a it's it's a significant PR opportunity. You might have two libertarians running, but but it, why not? You know, split up. You know, don't don't overlap your efforts. And state parties can do a good job, uh, you know, you know, coordinating that. But hey, if if two of if you like if Jim and I really wanted to run for senate here in Arizona, we're like, hey man, I really want you really want to run. All right, well let's 
see who can, you know, make, if we can't convince each other, well, we're both going to go into the state convention and make the best case that we should be the nominee. And if not, Jim, I, I hope that you run for Congress or governor, you know, and it's, it's, it, it, that's how these conversations happen. It's, it's really easy. Yeah. And then it typically does work that way. And we've had plenty, a lot of people come in when there has been a few of, of you know, seats that, you know, positions that were opposed. It was, hey, well, if I don't get it, I'm going to do this instead. So they all had their backup plan coming into it. So, I mean, it is, it's that easy. Um, as far as everybody knew that I was running, we, we, we announced it back then. My website, I, I basically, not for nothing, I, I left my website alone from 2018 and really I've carried it over to 2020. I've just rebranded it, Run Rufo 2020. I ran for the same seat. There, there it is right there. Um, there. There is a really nice donate button somewhere on there. So if anybody wants to, you know, take a look and, I think it's down a little bit there on the bottom left, right there in the middle. Yep. You click on that, you fill it out. We get a couple of bucks and we throw some more money our way so that we can make Chris Smith know that we exist and, and, and shift some policy making decisions. Um, you know, it, it's, we're starting our fundraising now. I've really been focused on signatures because the primary is in July. So I got to get my signatures turned in by July. That's the most important thing. That's the biggest focus. Cause if we're not on the ballot, it doesn't matter how much we fundraise. Um, I need money to get on the ballot, though, so I can get out and send out the emails and everything. So it doesn't take nearly as much. Um, but we're, we're going to be there no matter what. I mean, like I said, I'm almost at my, my signature count. It's, it, I'm going to be there and I'm going to be a force to be reckoned with this year. You know, I, I want to get 5% of the vote this year. You know, do I want to win? Absolutely. And if it starts to snowball, I'm going to do it. Don't get me wrong. You know, I'm, I'm going to make every case I have to to make sure that everybody knows I need to be the one that be in this seat to make sure that everyone has the best representative to, to, to promote freedom across the country. Because, you know, we need to make sure that's my Facebook page. By the way, anybody, you can find me on social media at Rufo for Congress right there. That same thing on all social media, Instagram, um, Twitter and Facebook. Um, yeah, listen, I want to raise twenty thousand dollars, get five percent. And make and make and make a mark in the race. In 2018, I got the Democrat to say that he believes in states' rights when he was on stage before they started screaming about states' rights. Because I continually pivot to the same issue of localizing government and why is why does Nancy Pelosi have a say in how we clean up the Jersey Shore, or why does why does Mitch McConnell have a say in what we're doing with with the with our money for our defense in New Jersey? You know, it's it's and that that's my constant message. And I'm, yeah driving home localization and making the community stronger because that's that's the right that's the proper role right yeah. I, I knew you'd like that one <laughs> yeah yeah no thank you mike no and i i really appreciate seeing what i have been advocating for the last two years with the presidential campaign about localization as a messaging and policy strategy that really works for libertarian candidates i'm glad you're applying that with success there even just rhetorically to say, why should they do it instead of us here in the community? Like, if we're the only party, because that's an, to me, that's an inherent implication of liberty. Localization is an implication of libertarianism because it is statism that uses force to concentrate power. Yes, you can have voluntary global conglomerates, sure. But that that's unjust power concentrated that comes from government, that comes from the old parties, that comes from status policy. If you just apply libertarianism at the at the level you're talking about federally, you're talking about localization, saying make it happen. And if we're the only party saying that, I think we start winning races. So, right. Mike, you know, thank you so much for joining us today. Any final thoughts or plugs you want to get in here? Listen, everybody, you know, there's been a lot of for the libertarian people in the libertarian party that are watching. There's been a lot of infighting. Um, we got to put that aside. We have the best presidential ticket we probably could have asked for with the with the entire party being represented. We have Spike as our VP. We have Joe, who is more radical than I realized she was um, oh, yeah. on the top of the ticket. And it, at every corner of this party should be happy with this ticket from the radicals because Spike is there and from the Prags because they endorse Joe. It, 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 this is this is the ticket we should have the most volunteers coming back to the party for. This is the ticket that should be bringing the most new membership. And honestly, I think this ticket's going to get more votes than Gary Johnson did. So we got to push that home. That's going to help. Yeah. Of the down ballot candidates that's going to help me that's going to help the guy running for auditor that's going to help the gal running for for board of ed everybody that's going to have the libertarian 
name next to their name is going to be successful if we can focus and come together, get over all the drama. I don't care who you like and who you don't like. Let's all love Joe and Spike and get together to make sure the Libertarian Party succeeds this year. Absolutely beautiful. Well said, Mike. And one last thought I have to add on to this conversation is that if you're not ready to run in 2020, or if you don't have an opportunity to run that you're comfortable with, volunteer for another campaign. If you can do it locally, great. If you can do it virtually with anybody anywhere in the country, or really any libertarian anywhere in the world. And if you take that first step and you see how easy it can be, and by the way, you can make it as hard as you want for yourself, but it can be how easy it can be to be a libertarian candidate who's taken seriously enough to get your voice out there and take advantage of this platform and this empty seat. You can really be a huge amplifier. Donate if you can donate, but if you can, really donating time and getting involved, helping someone like Mike get a few interviews in local papers, local blogs, podcasts, getting him invite, helping him coordinate his schedule to go to, you know, Rotary Club and League of Women Voters events where they're just going to invite anybody who's on the ballot can come and talk for five minutes, help him find those events, get his message out. He's primed. He's ready as a volunteer for his campaign or like hundreds, if not thousands of libertarians across the country. And so we're at hundreds. I think, I don't know if we're at thousands yet of campaigns as serious as yours, Mike. Definitely at thousands of libertarian candidates across the country. Probably just a few hundred that are as serious as Mike right now or more. But find one, get involved, volunteer, and that's going to set you up for your own success later on and help build the movement. I'm <laughs> sorry.